when I first got into skating, I was 13, so uh, I'd already been playing music, you know, from basically, or starting to understand music probably from age three, you know, on. So skating gave me a sense of uh, having a little bit more aggression and finding different things because skaters listen to different things. They listen to rock bands and some funk bands, but, they, but every skater had a weird band that they listened to. And that, to me, turned me on to more music because from skaters, I found out about the Sex Pistols, The Clash, Basement Five, you know, Pretenders, all these different groups, B-52s, you know, this dude, Mark Minuti, who lived in Delaware, turned me on to all the punk rock. I was going to discos, like, hanging out. Like, I, I loved playing rock music, but as a young person, you know, we went to this place in, you know, Wilmington, Delaware, called Electric Gramophone, and that's where we hung out, and then they turned it into a roller rink at one point, you know what I mean? It's just funny the different changes to it, but as far as skateboarding, when it first hit me at age 13, you know, I'm in my 40s now, like 45, but it's just amazing that it started so basic with this like thick wood boards, like one big lump clump board, not, not even laminated boards, small trucks, big urethane wheels, into all this like mega ramps and the dude jumping the Great Wall in China, and just like this unbelievable, it's like Evil Knievel took over. And skateboarding is, 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 is intense enough and, and also intelligent enough to create these dynamics where people can just blow up. And it's helped out music. Now hip hop is like kind of feeding off of skateboarding. When everybody used to have skateboarding feeding off of it, now it's turned around and opened its doors because the loyal followers in skating are, are great. They don't really pay attention to each other that much. They pay attention to what gets them off, you know? And that's the same thing we had kind of in the early punk rock days. I think skateboarding just grew up and it has more of a loyal following. So the punkers in skating hang with the punkers in skating, the people that love hip hop or classic rock. I mean, there's all these people that if you go to a skate park and listen to every, what, what everybody's checking out, you'll just be blown away because there's just a lot of individuals and a lot of talented people too, artists. You know, this dude, Adam Wallacabbage, who's from Philly. You know, we went to a bunch of shows together. Tim Glom, who's doing really good. He worked with Bam Margera. And even Bam, I mean, he started out in the scene, the, the punk scene. And so it's good that we all have an extension through skateboarding and music. But it seems like it's always connected to an underground, which is a new source of people. And now we're like kind of the regulars out of that new source of people. And there's all these other new people. But hopefully they'll be able to understand that the history that we laid down is for real. Like, the reason why people are being interviewed right now is because there's a story that needs to be told so you know that people were here doing brilliant things and one we just were like sitting around like with our thumbs up our asses, you know what I mean? It was a pretty classic time for music in local bands. Oh yeah. Skateboarding through the 70s and then uh, through Skateboarder Magazine stuff got involved in uh, punk rock and then you know started from from after getting involved in punk rock started playing in the bands and so skateboarding got me into uh, mu punk rock music and uh, that's how I started playing in the band our first band I was 15 my brother was 11 and uh, we played in 1982, we played our first show as child abuse at the Fast Lane in 82 with Chronic Sick and Fatal Rage and a couple other bands. And uh, we still, and we never never stopped skateboarding. It was, uh, it was always uh, skateboarding and music was my life since the late 70s and still is today in 2007. And uh, me and my brother have been skateboarding, surfing, and playing music since then. Uh, we went from child abuse, and uh, I went to uh, Murphy's Law. It was an, an original, uh, one of the original Murphy's Law crew. 
And actually, when Har Harley left Murphy's Law, Dean was uh, 12, and he filled in on drums for Murphy's Law when he was 12, and, and I was playing bass in Murphy's Law all the time, still skateboarding. And um, we had plenty of, uh, we had ramps, Belmar, and out in uh, the wall ramp, and all throughout that time, like I met the guys from Kraut, and uh, the guys from Murphy's Law, and uh, Gilligan's Revenge, who became Token Entry, uh, Eddie from Leeway, everyone used to come down to our house from the city in Belmar and, and skate. And me, the guys from Crowd, and Eddie from Leeway, and, and Jimmy from Murphy's Law was was uh, actually a figure. He was always here. He basically, we lived between Belmar and, and New York. And then you know, we moved on. We had good humor and uh, Murphy's Law, good humor, underdog, all, all the bands, and we had the fast lane. And, and then, you know, CBGB's and Dean was, uh, we used to skate out, outside in front of CBGB's and it was just uh, still the continuum of our lives of skateboarding and music. Dean was so young, when he was like 11, 12, he was so small and uh, Hilly's wife Karen wouldn't let him in CBGB's. So what we would do is Jimmy or Harley or somebody and, or would, would uh, bring out the bass drum for the band that was playing after they took the drum out. We'd bring it back outside. We'd put Dean in the bass drum case empty, carry him back into Seabees, and then open up the case in the dressing room back there, and Dean would pop out of the, <laughs> out of the bass drum case. He was only like this big. And, uh, and then he would, he would hang out, and that's what we did all the time. And uh, one time, Karen actually opened the dressing room and saw him in there, and she's like, oh, you, you again. And she brought him to the front desk and called my mom. And, uh, but my mom was just like, yeah, I know, he, I know he's at CBG, because I know he's cool, and she let him stay. But, uh, <laughs> you know, still to till till this day, um, 2007, we've got, we have, a, um, we have a private half pipe in Belmar in a warehouse and a 35 foot wide half pipe and a bunch of older guys. We all have keys and we skate there once a week, twice a week, whenever we can get over there, we skate, get out of the house, get away from the wives and the, you know, forget about the jobs and the headaches and uh, we go and skate. And uh, you know, you, I tell people, come, up, come, come through the front door, I'll leave the side door open, come through the door and just listen. And as soon as you open the door, you, you'll hear minor threat or something, or negative approach, or Black Sabbath or whatever blasting. And you walk through the, the second door and there we are, you know, just hanging out on the platform, skating the half pipe, listening to minor threat. Just like we were doing in 86. I went to see, uh, I went to see Black Flag at the, at the fast lane. Just, just, uh, I, just when Henry had started singing, and um, I was like 17 or so, and you had to be 21 to get in here. So I borrowed my friend's driver's license, and he had a really long last name with the paper driver's license. And uh, I came out to get some air. And I come out to get some air, and uh, I go to go to back in, and the guy says, uh, let me see your license. And they hadn't, didn't even ask me the first time, but he looks at the license and he looks at me and he says, uh, spell your last name. And I was like, oh shit, I couldn't spell last name. So he kept the license and he wouldn't let me go, go let me back in. And Black Flag hadn't even played yet. So I went through this, I went through the side, the side alleyway between the fast lane and the baronet. And there was a metal door in there. And it was, it was dead bolted, but yeah, I could see in through the, there was no door knob. And since it was metal, I, I bent up. I bent up the corner of the door, and I just kept bending the door up. And I bent the door up enough to to crawl through. And I crawled back in and snuck through. But I came in behind the stage, didn't know where I was. Came through under the stage and got back in. And I was like 16, 17, and there just was they. There was no way that they were going to keep me out of that show. I mean, I just, I, I had no idea that that's what I was going to do. But the next thing I know, I was, I was kicked out and I was bending the door open to sneak back in. And, you know, nice. that's what you did. That you can do that when, in that. When, uh, when the casino skate park was there, that was uh, the, actually the, the, re, the rebuilding that's going on now in Asbury hadn't started yet. It was all still, it was all still a ghetto. And that's one reason that I think the, the Asbury uh, Casino Skate Park 
uh, failed because a lot of mom and dads and stuff from the surrounding suburbs like Manasquan and Spring Lake and you know Bradley Beach, Belmar, Deal, whatever, were afraid to drop their kids off because the casino skate park was actually in a bad neighborhood. So uh, it lasted for a long time, and you know then it didn't. It started out just as a skate park, and basically to do the bands was a fun thing to do, but also. It helped, needed to do that to pay the rent because the skate park wasn't doing that good. Basically, uh, it was haunted because it was in a, a bad neighborhood. And moms and dads were, were afraid to you know, drop their kids off and come back because yeah. it, wasn't, it wasn't safe. New Jersey, there was a park so unique to all our skate parks, it was called Fiber Rider, and it was made of fiberglass pre-molded uh, ramps, and they were shaped, so there was a half pipe, put two more sections on the type on the top, and you had a full pipe, and that was unbelievable. We had seen pictures of full pipes out in Mount Baldy in California and everything, but actually skating in a full pipe was unbelievable. Uh, the park was perfect. It was, after a while, not really that challenging, but it was perfect because it was all synthetic. It was manufactured. Uh, now, in Asbury Park, as Asbury Park kind of imploded, and they had space for lease in that big open area right in the boardwalk, uh, it was called Casino Arena, and that was a skate facility. At the time, it was one of the first out of wooden ramps um, because everything else at, at that time was concrete, which was cool. Right? But this was wooden half pipes and they actually had a major competition there on like an East Coast thing at a gigantic ramp called the Skabo ramp, S-K-A-B-O. And it was the hardest, hardest ramp you could ever imagine. It was like a death ride because you just took this enormous drop in, had these terrible transitions when you hit the flat and you had like two quick jolts up to like six feet of vertical. It was, and it was polyurethane. It was really, really hard to skate, but uh, it was like anything else. Skateboarders are really so passionate about doing this stuff. So I knew guys, the kids I skated with from North Plainfield who were able to get in there and we skated kind of off hours. And you know what? They ended up winning that competition because they had time to skate there and get those transitions worked out. And it was hard, but um, again, it took advantage of that big empty pocket in Asbury Park. <laughs> 